Well, good morning, everybody. God bless you. Welcome. For those of you who are watching online, we love having you. We're jumping through. We're on question 244. We're going question by question through a book called To Be a Christian. And now we're starting on something called liturgy, something we do every single week. Let's find out what this word means. Who wants to read 244? Huh? Yeah. What is liturgy? Liturgy is an established pattern or form for the worship of God by God's people. The liturgy leads us into the remembrance of God's mighty acts and unites us in graceful response. Okay, so liturgy, if you think, is the bones that hold up the body, or it's the way or the form in which things are done. As a cleaner, one of the things that we always do when we go into a bathroom especially is we soak everything down first and we let the chemicals start doing their disinfecting work and their cleaning power work, okay? That's our form. We don't go in and do something else. We start with one and then we go to two and then we go to three because we want to produce good results. When we come for liturgy, this is the established pattern or form from which we worship with God's people. So this is something we do all together. And first and foremost, the liturgy leads us to remember God. All right, now, every church or every group of people that worships as a church has a liturgy, even if they don't call it a liturgy, meaning they all have a form or a way which they do things like worship God. So when I was growing up, I didn't have the Anglican experience um, in my early 20s, but we still did things. We sang three songs every week. Two of them were usually more upbeat. One was the slow one. Then our pastor would get up and preach about an hour. How about that, guys? An hour, an hour and 15 minutes. And then he would pray for about another five minutes. And then after that, he'd call everybody forward for prayer. Same thing every single week. That's how we worship God. So even if people don't call it a liturgy, everybody has structure or bones or form by which they worship. And it should, and if you see here in your notes, call us to remember God's mighty acts. So what we're doing should be focused on who? On God. Yeah, right? And so the liturgy focuses on remembering God's mighty acts, and then it unites us in what's called a grateful response. It's not thanking man or what man can do. Who's it putting it on again? God. Look at Psalm 118. Someone up to Psalm 118. The Jewish people worshipped with liturgy. So the church did not get this out of nowhere. It wasn't like, hey... What should we do when we gather together? Well, what did the root of our faith, which was a Jewish root that got fulfilled in the Messiah, Jesus, how did they worship? Well, here is an example of some of the things that they did in Psalm 118. Anybody there? Yeah. All right, Kelly. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, because his mercy endureth forever. Let Israel now say that his mercy endureth forever forever. Let the house of Aaron now say that his mercy endureth forever. All right, let me stop you there, Kelly, because you're going to read another second. What are the Psalms? Who remembers? Songs. Songs. They're songs, right? Yeah. So this is what everybody was singing together. Now, Kelly read in verse 2, it says, let Israel now say. So what should they say? His mercy endures forever. These are, they're being instructed on what they should be saying. Very similarly, when we go upstairs and we sing, we're looking at the, the big projector. You get a part, I get a part. It sounds like a country song. You get a part in. No. no. Yeah. That was bad. That was bad. Okay. Uh, so let Israel now say his mercy endure forever. Now look at verse 3. Kelly read, now let the house of Aaron now say. So what do these priests now say? Mercy endures forever. Yeah, right? All right, so Kelly, go ahead and read verse 4 and 5. Let them now that they fear the Lord say that his mercy endures forever. All right, so stop you there. Just in case anybody in the audience was wondering, wait, am I of the house of Israel? I don't know what house I'm from. Am I a house of Aaron? If anybody fears God, what should they say? His mercy, mercy endures, endures forever. forever. See the form and the structure that's happening? Kelly, go ahead and read verse 5. I called upon the Lord in distress. The Lord answered me and set me in a large place. Okay, who are we talking to here in this verse? The Lord. The Lord, right? That's what we're saying in our answer, that it calls us to remember God's mighty acts and then an ungrateful response. We're not going to read the whole psalm. Okay, but this is very common. And so in the early church, the psalms were their hymn book. Okay, they used to literally sing this um, all the way through all 150 of them, 
or more maybe, depending on what part of the church you're from. <laughs> and they're going to sing through this liturgy in response. Um, let's read and see if the New Testament Christians picked up this idea. Look at 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26. Let's see if they had a form and a structure that they did. 1 Corinthians 11, 23. Here's the Apostle Paul. Paul, you want to read that? You got it open? Mm -hmm. Okay. And he's telling us what it's going to be. What are we going to do? For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Okay, so again, there's a little do this and do that. We're just going to go through. Again, this is again the bones of why we do what we do. We take communion every week because this is what Paul received from the Lord. Now, how many of you think since we call ourselves Christians, we should probably do what the Lord says to do? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Right? All right? And people wonder, like, what does God tell us to do? Right here. Paul says, For I received from the Lord in 23, which I delivered to you. Here's the Corinthians. We know from chapter 10, they were already eating the, the bread, which is the flesh of Christ, and they're drinking the cup, which is the blood of Christ. He went through this whole thing. And he says that on the same night he took the bread, he gave thanks and broke it, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. What do I say when we do communion every week? That right there, okay? I don't make up anything, okay? I just want people to be focused on Jesus, focused on the Thanksgiving. And then he says, interestingly though, look at the verse of 24. It says, do this. Do this. If Jesus says, do this, what should we do? Do it. All right, all right. Again, I'm, I know this sounds like, you know, it's not too hard stuff. We're in a thing. We're in preschool. No, I'm kidding. No, it's true, but we need to be... I'm joking, Pastor. I don't, I don't know if I ever graduated Christian preschool, so I'm in. 25. In the same manner, he also took the cup after the supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do. What should we do? In remembrance of me. Amen. Which is what the words you hear me say every single week. Yeah. Okay, and so he says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Right in our liturgy, we say, Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ... Come, come again. again. We get it right from here. Okay? And so the idea for liturgy is that we want to focus on Him, but we all do it together. So one of the things you see me do is part of it, but am I the only one talking up there? No, we all do it together. Okay? And that's what liturgy is going to be. I'm the lead of it, but I'm not the only one worshiping God. We do this together. And so if you come on Wednesdays, and you see that service, my back is actually turned many times away from the audience because we're doing it together. It's not that I don't like people, okay? It's because we're turned. We're worshiping God together, all right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, we're going to read 245, question 245, and then we'll stop for questions. 245. Why do Anglicans worship with a structured liturgy? Why do Anglicans, which is what our church is, why do we worship with a structured liturgy? Anglicans worship with a structured liturgy because it embodies first biblical patterns of worship, comma, two, it fosters reverence and love for God, three, it deepens faith in Jesus Christ, and four, is in continuity or it continues with the practice of Israel and the early church. Okay, so again, we're not the only Christians that do this. And even if Christian churches don't say they have liturgy, you watch. When you go to most churches, they do the same thing every week in a set pattern. So why do we do it? Number one, because it's biblical. Okay, so the early church did what the Jews did, which you'll see if you go to, even to a synagogue today. They read scripture, which is what we do. <laughs> then a rabbi or an elder would get up and teach, which is what we do. And then what they don't do is celebrate communion. <laughs> okay. But we know that the early Christians were doing this. This guy named Justin Martyr, he's a very, very early Christian. He writes to uh, someone who was accusing Christians of being cannibals. They said, you guys are a bunch of evil, crazy people because you eat flesh and blood. And Justin's like, hey guys, look, we're not cannibals. Let me tell you what we do. We take bread, not human flesh, 
And we believe that Jesus transforms in that moment what is happening in the bread and gives us his real, his real body and blood. But we're not eating human beings here. He said, so when we gather together, we read scripture, a guy gets up and preaches, we take an offering for the poor, and an elder teaches. That's what we do every single week. And we do it on the Lord's Day, which is Sunday. Okay, so we know early on they practiced a biblical pattern that's similar to the synagogue. Number two, it says it fosters reverence and love for God. Now, this may sound like a duh, but I do want you to know there's churches out there that their main job is to entertain you. And it may or may not lead you to a reverence and a love for God. It may entertain you, which I'm not saying is always bad, okay? But at church, it should foster your love for God, okay? And so if we're focusing on Scripture, this is going to be an amazing segue into that. And then it says it practices, it, it continues with the practices of Israel and the early church. So why that's important is because they're in the body of Christ just like we are. So we are all one body. Now they've graduated. They're the church triumphant. And we're still here fighting in the earth as the militant. But if they had a really good idea from the Holy Spirit, why do I have to make up a new one? So if, for example, they said, look, we see from the scripture that taking communion is important when we gather weekly, why do I need to make up something different? If it was good for them, it's going to be good for me. Okay? If they agreed, and this is something we teach about being Catholic, okay, that, that, that if all the universal Christians agree that this part of Scripture is important for us to do, I'm going to follow them. Okay, we're going to read something now called the Didache, or the Didash, depending on how you pronounce it. This is an early document that's written during the time of the Apostles. So between 50 and 90 A.D., Peter's alive, Paul's alive, John's alive, and about a couple other disciples are still alive. Many of them are getting martyred. So we want to know what were they doing. Dude, no glasses today. <laughs> All right, what were they doing? Well, they wrote it down. Okay, this is not in the Bible, but I want to read you a book that they wrote what they were doing. Were they worshiping with liturgy? Let's see. It says in one of their books, it says, and concerning baptism, baptize this way. Does that sound familiar language? Having first all these things, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Where does that come from? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, and Son, and Holy Spirit. The Great Commission. It comes from the Great Commission, right? They're, they're using a form, and they're using Scripture to inform that form. Ha! How about that for form? Wow. That was a lot of cheese there, Eli. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so then they say... Um, and if you can do it in living water or running water, great. But if not, living water, baptize them into some other water, meaning a pool. It doesn't have uh, uh, river-like qualities. If not, cold and warm. But if you have neither cold nor warm, pour out water thrice upon the head in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay, so they're worshiping according to a form. You guys get what I'm saying here? And then real quick... What did they do during Eucharist or Thanksgiving, during the bread and wine? Now, concerning the Thanksgiving or the Eucharist, thus give thanks. And then they tell you, first concerning the cup, we thank you, Father, for the holy vine of David, your servant, you've made known to us through Jesus, your Lord, to the glory to you be forever. And concerning the broken bread, and they go on and they begin to pray parts of scripture and church tradition. Okay, so they're praying with liturgy is my point. All right, um, let's do two scriptures. In Acts 2.42, someone up to Acts 2.42, and then we'll open it up for questions. Acts 2.42 in Psalm 96. <laughs> Acts 2.42. Ma'am, I see that hand back there. Thank you. <laughs> Acts 2.42. Okay, let's listen to what the early Christians were doing. Go ahead. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. All right, the apostles' doctrine. What does that word doctrine mean? Anybody remember? It's a fancy word for something simple. It's their teaching. It's their teaching, yeah. So they continued in the apostles' teaching. What else, Merce? Fellowship. Fellowship. Breaking of bread and Amen. prayers. All right, so the apostles' teaching. What do we read after I preach every week? The Nicene what? Creed. Nicene Creed. This is what the church has said is a good summary of what the apostles taught. And at some of our services, we literally read what's called the Apostles' Creed, or what we believe the apostles taught us. Okay? Then they had fellowship. What do we do after church each week? 
We eat food and we fellowship. Glory to God, right? And we also fellowship when we have liturgy together, all right? What's the next one, Merce? Breaking of bread. Breaking of bread. Okay, so we do that two ways. What do we do every service? We communion, we break bread. And then what do we do after church? Break we break bread, okay? This is called the Lord's Table and then the Agape Feast or the Love Feast of the Church. And then what's the last one? Praying. Praying. So if you look in the Greek, all these words have prefixes of the before them. The prayers, these are the prayers of the people, for example, what we do every week. Okay, so we're worshiping, worshiping according this way. Anybody got Psalm 96? Yeah. All right, Kelly. Oh, sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Sing unto the Lord and bless his name. Shew forth his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the heathen, his wonders among all people. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. All right, let me stop you there, Kelly. What is one thing that you see us do all throughout our worship service? We sing and praise the Lord, okay? And it's incorporated not just when Abby leads us, but in all different sections of the liturgy, we sing. Christians are singing people. It's one of the things that marks us. We pray, we sing a lot, okay? Hopefully we're happy. <laughs> we do dance at times, you're right. All right, so, so far with liturgy, anyone have any questions, comments, or thoughts of what is liturgy and why do Anglicans worship with a structured liturgy? Questions, comments, thoughts? Eli. Is it appropriate to come up with your own form of liturgy for personal worship? Yes. From the scripture? Yeah, it's a good. I would say yes if it's patterned after scripture. Okay. Yep. And so there are other churches that have different patterned liturgies, and they're just emphasizing usually different parts of scripture. But it's usually the basis of all liturgies is that they're formed on scripture. Yep. Questions? Now, liturgies for main services like Eucharist are set. Those are the ones we wouldn't redo. But personal times, yeah, absolutely. Any other questions? And that brings up a good question, uh, Eli, bouncing off of yours, is if you go to other services and you see them doing things a different way, if it's patterned after Scripture, can we enjoy that with the Lord? Yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. So we are Christians who are using the Anglican liturgy to help us. Yes. Paul, um, would you do question 246 for me? Yeah. Does structured liturgy inhibit sincere and vibrant worship? No. A structured liturgy provides sincere worshipers, biblical language, and forms that train our hearts for worship. Liturgy enables us to worship God joyfully and with one voice. And some verses are 2 Samuel 6, 1 through 4, 2 Chronicles 29, Psalm 68, 24 through 33, 1 Corinthians 14, 26 through 33, and 39 and 40, and then Revelation 7. 9 through 8, 5. Okay, this is a question that I get asked a lot from people. Is the like, I can't enter into um, liturgical worship. It's just dead. It's dry. It's boring. We repeat the same things over and over again. Is it, it's going to stop me. That word vibrant means to have like an active or lively sort of worship. It's going to stop me from having that. Well, <sighs> yes and no. Okay. Um, it's entirely possible for something to be dead, right? If we repeat the same things, it could be dead. But is that going to stop us if our heart is engaging with it week after week? Paul? I don't hear people complaining about singing the same worship songs. Very good, right? right. And again, if we're gonna just be honest that everybody has liturgy, it's possible to have a dead liturgy that does two fast songs, one slow song, and then listening to your pastor for now, all that can be dead just as well. And you'll see one of the things that we emphasize so much. It's on the front slide. It says, let these words pass through your heart before they come out your lips. Because we want you to believe. Okay? So I think the answer is no. A structured liturgy provides sincere worshipers, biblical language, that's number one, and then it forms and trains the heart. Now, here's why we do the same things every week. Does anybody work out in here where you do the same workout routine on a consistent basis? Sure, I do it. Okay, as well. 
And one of the things, like if you do leg days, like squats where you're bending up and down, what will get stronger? Your legs. Your legs. And you may do it every Monday, right? But if you want to have strong legs, what are you going to have to do every Monday? Right. Legs, legs, right? Arms are the next thing, okay? Cardio, if you maybe do power walking or if you go jogging. L listen, again, we do the same things. What you, <laughs> what you repeat is what you become. I, I want to I say that again. What you repeat is what you become, yeah. okay? It can be boring at times. I get it. But the idea, too, is we also need to grow, okay? So um, provide sincere worship with biblical language and forms that trains our heart for worship, Okay, so imagine a world not like America. So in America, we have over 90% of people can read. The majority of the world today, it's only 50%. So if we take the seven point something billion people in the world and you went one, two, one, two, all the way down the line, every two cannot read, period. That's a lot of people, yeah, okay? Is. And in the early church, it was higher than that. So this is one of the reasons that we also repeat things every week is because if you don't have books or you can't read, if you repeat it, you'll start to memorize it and it gets in here. So pretty quickly, if I did something like this and I said, our father, who art in heaven, be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, right? So we're teaching people how to pray, okay? So think of little ones right now that come to our church. I've watched this happen somewhere between five and seven, they start mimicking the words that I say on a consistent basis. Most of it is scripture. 80% of what I say, if it's in the liturgy, is from scripture. Guys, they're getting God's word in their heart. It's amazing. They may or may not be good readers at that point between age five and seven. So in the church, they were very big on this because one, books were very expensive with little access, and two, you probably couldn't read, okay? So the same things were repeated because it's good discipleship. Now, liturgy enables us to worship God joyfully with one voice. Jesus prayed that we would be one, as him and the Father are one. It is one of the coolest things for me when I'm sitting on the first or second row and I hear everybody behind me in unity saying something. It is so cool because we're all worshiping God together, okay? And we get to pr get his prayer answered. So one of the things I encourage people is that liturgy is a fireplace for the fire of your love for God, okay? It is a fireplace for the fire of your love for God. It allows it to burn bright and it allows it to burn clear. And if you don't have a fireplace, sometimes your fire can get out of control. It fizzles out, it could burn things or burn people, okay? Let's look at Revelation 15. We're gonna look at Revelation 15 and we're gonna look at verses two through five. One of the things that I think is pretty vibrant is, is I'm just gonna take a guess, it's wild, but I think in heaven, they have some pretty seriously cool worship. I think when they're around Jesus. Anybody agree? I agree. All right. So let's see how they're worshiping in heaven. Mm -hmm. Revelation 15. Let's read verses 1 through 5, somebody. Nick? Awesome. Um, and I saw what a... Oh, my bad. <laughs> so, wait. You said uh, 1 through 5? Yeah, Revelation 15, 1 through 5. Oh, okay. Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and amazing, Seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last, for with them the wrath of God is finished. And I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire, and also those who had conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name, standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their hands. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord, God the Almighty. Uh, dr just and true are your ways, O King of the nations, who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name. For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. After this I looked, and the sanctuary of the ten of the witness in heaven was opened. Five? Good. Yeah. Okay, so guys, that picture for us, there has been like this cataclysmic, amazing stuff happening on the earth. The windows or curtains are opened up and here they are worshiping God by what, I don't even know what a sea of glass really could be. It's got fire in it on top of it. And around the throne, they're singing a liturgical song, the song of Moses. They're going back to the Old Testament and they're taking it and seeing it through the lamb. 
Oh, just and true are all of your ways, Jesus, the king of all the nations. And they're worshiping using liturgy. And one of the things we see in Revelation 4 and 5, again, the curtains are opened up. It says, they never stop saying, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty was and is and is to come, which we repeat some of that again in our services. Guys, it's pretty vibrant in heaven, all right? And if they're worshiping that way, again, why come up with something new? Why don't we worship the way they worship? And so a lot of things that you see pattern in Revelation, we do. We have, they have candles, we have candles. Um, there's vestments or robes or stoles, similar to what they have in the book of Revelation, and it continues on and on. We're patterning to lift people up to, this is, this is the reality, worship of God, all right? So it can be um, an inhibitor, but it's, it's more about your heart, okay? It doesn't have to be if your heart is in it. All right, how we doing, Paul? Good? All right, let's do one more, and then we will stop for today. 247, and we'll stop for today. All right, so 247, what is the role of Scripture in the prayer book? All right, so guys, if you are watching, and this is your first time with us, uh, this is what's called a prayer book. All right, and in it has these things we say we've been talking about as liturgies, all right? And so what is the role of Scripture in the prayer book? The Book of Common Prayer is saturated with Scripture, organizing and orchestrating them for worship. It helps us to pray together in God's Word that He gave us Himself with order, beauty, joy, deep devotion, and great dignity. So there was an old school guy named Thomas Cramner, and he gathered a bunch of liturgies from the ancient church and put it in one book for us. But he did it, and the word is common, so that the common people can pray. They can learn to pray the scripture. So his idea was it doesn't have to be somebody in a monastery, though that's cool. It doesn't have to be someone with a collar on, though that's cool. Anybody commonly can pray the prayers of the scripture found in that book. Okay, and we'll go over this a little bit more next week, but I just wanted to expose that to you. The role of scripture is predominant in here. It's almost 80%, which is what we'll cover a little bit later, uh, later next week. All right, well, let me stop there for questions, comments as we, uh, as we wrap up. Yes, Nick. Yeah, so what about like baptism? So I remember it saying in, um, I forget what verse it was, but it was talking about how if you can't baptize with like water, like a full submission, mm -hmm. you can do like three um, drops of water over the head. Yes. So would that be the same as like Catholic baptism? Or? Yeah, so this is a Didache again for those of you who are watching online. Um, what it says is if you can do it in living water, baptize into that water. If not cold, if warm, if you have neither, uh, neither running water, hot nor cold, pour thrice upon the head three times in them, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The church is taught that baptism is three modes. It can be dunking or submersion. It can be pouring over the head, or it can even be sprinkling. And these all come from scripture verses. Okay, so you'll see them throughout the New Testament. But yes, the Roman Catholics practice this, the Orthodox practice this, the Anglicans practice this, the Lutherans practice this, the Methodists practice this, a number of churches practice that, those three modes. I have my personal preferences, but the scripture and church history allow for all three. Thank you. Yeah. Good. Anyone else? Questions, comments, thoughts? All right, well, let's go ahead and pray, and we'll stop for today. Father, thank you so much for a chance, once again, to be around your word. Lord, use it to, again, touch our hearts, that we may know you and love you, the one God and the Christ whom you sent. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you so much. God bless you.